My life has been basically dealing with a lot of death, serving the dead. The Couch and First Nations community is located in the traditional Coast Salish territory of Vancouver Island on Canada's west coast. I've been a traditional grave digger in our community since the age of 15 fulfill in the sacred duty of helping a family's loved ones pass into the spirit world. Sadly though, our work is not limited to the people who have recently made such a journey. It is also my task to rebury ancestral remains and artifacts displaced by desecration of sacred resting places. There are thousands of graveless ancestors and artifacts imprisoned for decades in museums and warehouses around the world, awaiting repatriation to the lands where they belong. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional territory that we're on. First of all, uh, my Indian name is Colpinston. I've been grave digging probably over 47 years, I'd say. And I've been doing archaeology for repatriation, gathering, whatever, for about 23 and a half years. So half and half of my life doing both those jobs. Like the new death, the old death. You can't just come onto a site and recover ancestral people because you have to belong to that work, which we belong to, I belong to. We are at the archaeological site of Yayamnuts, uh, Seminoles Creek in the Cowichan Valley. This site was discovered uh, during land development in 1992. And when they began to start land clearance back then, Local residents saw some, uh, some remains in a backfill pile from a bulldozer. And after that, there was a salvage excavation back in 1992 uh, to screen the backfill and recover the remains that were exposed. Uh, I believe they uncovered about 12 different individuals at that time. And some of the individuals were elaborately uh, sort of uh, uh, had funerary artifacts associated with them, a copper ornament, uh, some dentalia beads, shell beads from the west coast. The cultural workers on a site working with an archaeologist are key. They take direction from us. So they'll ask me, Harold, is this okay that we can do this? Are you against if we do this? They do the science, we do it. We look after the cultural. So this site to me personally carries a lot of respect and honor to be here. We believe as, as First Nations people that the ancestral people are here and they're watching us and to make sure that they're not going to get bothered again. The human remains found at Yayamnats were returned to the earth, but the artifacts that were removed have been in the Royal BC Museum for almost a quarter century. My mission is to see them return to the ancestors. There's a death and the family comes to me. It doesn't matter if I've buried three people a week ago, I've got another one and I've done it days apart. 
I have to keep going. That, that becomes very hard on the soul, the salit. Every one of you has the soul. In our language, it's called salit. That's your soul. That's your inner self. That's who you are. That's who I am. When there's a funeral, there's so much I have to prepare for, and I prepare four days prior to the funeral. I have to get ready. I set myself in my mind, soul, and then I stay away from people. I usually head to the water and to the mountains. I get ready mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. We're heading over to Penalicut Island this morning and we're going to be spending a day with uh, an elder, August Sylvester. This man to me is, uh, is very knowledgeable. He's like a walking encyclopedia for the work that we do. There's a lot of things that give remains away who they are. We go along the beaches here and we walk and we see them. Cliffs. Sometimes there's a cave there. Along here, there's a very few caves along Galliano and Valdez. But there's a lot of bodies in there. And they'll tell you who you, they are. We'll know where they're from. Sometimes you see bones and they got deformed heads. They're from up north. Mm. Our people were not laying in the ground buried. Our people were in the rocks not in the dirt. We never buried our people. We put them in caves and in the rocks. The reason we start burying our people, when the ships came in, they start stealing the bones and taking mm. them away. That's how we got into burying them? Because of theft of theft. remains yeah. and tools and artifacts? Yeah, that is why we started taking them and burying them, putting them away and, and try to keep it a secret where mm. we're going. Mm -hmm. Do our people stay? Are they here? Do they leave? Sometimes you see bones come out of the ground and they're getting washed out by the ocean. Mm. Sometimes they don't leave even then. They've been gone so long, but you go there and you pick them up and move them. They won't leave. They want to be here on this time. That's why the last part is when you burn burn the food, right. clothes, and there's work beyond their way. This is a big learning for our people, what we do, for the people that's gone ahead. Hmm. We teach our children that this is a time for respect when you talk like this when we're talking. You start seeing shell maiden material, there are definite areas that you would want to be very cautious and careful with. Just looking at this, I mean, it makes me wonder what's under here. And I'm sure there's people here, no doubt about it. The common soul would say, oh, it's just a dump. And that's been referred to our people, oh, you guys had dump sites. Well, no, they're not dump sites. Like, and I, I hate that phrase, that term. Oh, you guys just, you know, dumped your clamshells here and there and everywhere. Well, no. There were, there were places that we harvest, and it, it was a site, it was a village or a campsite or a major, major gathering, food-burning place. And then you look at rocks. That's how you identify. You, you, it's called an FCR, fire-cracked rock. And you'll look at it, and then you'll see it's all been charred and it's rough. And, in, and, and amongst the shell and material, you're going to find tools, artifacts, stone tools, bone tools. And then you got to really, you know, slow down, stop, and then bring a person like myself in and Augie, and then we work with the archaeologists to uh, do the recovery.
So I just was on the beach and just walking and I found an FCR. You see that coloration there, it's kind of dark, so it's cooked. Look at this rock here. This is just a beach rock, natural rock in its own natural form. It's not burnt and rough looking as this. Yes, they are two different rocks, but this one in my left hand has been altered, fire altered, cooked. And this one hasn't. When you're on those kind of sites and when you're, you're recovering ancestral people and then when you're recovering the tools especially, I mean, the energy around that is quite amazing because now these people are, they come right to where that site is. The old people are, are there going, well, what are they doing? Why are they doing this? Why are you digging that up? That's my place. You have no right here. But we're there because of a development. We're there because of disturbance. My job is to make the recovery, make the bed, get them back to sleep get the artifacts, tools, everything that needs to go back with them, back with them quickly as we can. Things we do in our lifetime is so important to a lot of people, even the smartest people depend on us, the people we call archeologists. Well, there was a village site here, yes? Yes, yeah, so the village site extended from the houses here, yep. as far as we know, and extended all the way along the full length of the beach yep. to the bedrock over there, and then continued to where those white apartment buildings are in the distance. Okay. There used to be a long house after long house after long house, you know, kids on the beach and smokes coming out of the, out of the houses and canoes on the beach. This entire landform that we're on is a blue camas garden, or is more accurately, a series of blue camas gardens. Uh, so camas extended across the entire length of this landform between these two, these two major village sites. Wow. And so families would come and they would um, clear stones from these fields. They would uh, weed out the competing plants uh, and really worked hard to cultivate this plant and produce enormous, enormous amounts of it you'll see there's actually very few stones, and this is actually a really rocky landscape here. Uh, and so all the stones were cleared out of this and they're piled along the edges of this. And they're mostly in the snow areas now, so you can't see them so much anymore. But also around this camas garden are burial cairns. So ringing all the way around here, there are about a dozen burial cairns just right around here. And so one of the things that it looks to me like people were doing, say a thousand, maybe 1500 years ago, is they were taking stones from the cleared fields and building burial cairns with them. A big part of this is also looking at the plants, that this isn't just a cemetery or it isn't right. just a village, that it's a garden yeah. and that it's a landscape that uh, the Coast Seals people have worked for thousands of years, really worked very hard, mm. you know, to, to maintain this, to create it. And so, in effect, what we get is this family-owned, um, economically and nutritionally and culturally very important um, food-producing place, but also... Um, intertwined with with the spiritual aspect of, of having their ancestors mm. ancestors there around around them. What got you into where we are now, or where you are now? <laughs> How I became an archaeologist. Yes. Yeah. When I was I was about nine or ten, I wanted to be a paleontologist. You know, like every kid, I was really interested in dinosaurs, and I found this strange thing that looked like a bowl, uh, but it's made out of stone. And uh, I went to our local museum and showed them the bowl, and they said, well, sure enough, it was actually a stone bowl. Mm. And uh, on the inside, it was covered with, with red ochre, with, with hematite, mm. the tumuth. Mm. And since that moment, I've been entangled with archaeology ever since, 40 years later. I'm still looking for a little bit still of stone. Still looking for stones. <laughs> tumuth, you mentioned in that bowl you found, it's used in, in different practices, not just in death. Mm -hmm. You know, it's used in longhouse ceremonies where there's, you know, people don't want to get zapped. The tummuth keeps you safe, protects you, if you will. It's a, it's a barrier so the, the ancestral, the old people, or even the new people can't hurt you. And I wore it a couple times. I put it on when I was fresh into grave digging and wore it and stuff. And to me, it seemed to do something different to me, on a, not a physical, but a spiritual. So I went back to my grandfather and I told him, and then he said, don't wear it. Your great-great-grandfather, Chris, 
when the Europeans came and gave us that sickness of smallpox, him and his wife used to go out and gather the dead. And he never wore it. And he was burying people all day from morning till dusk. And at that time, you know, when smallpox was around, I mean, we were dying by the score. I believe I have a relationship with that other world. My work starts at four o'clock in the morning. It's by hand. There's no machine. We're going through hard pan light. You know, you're barely getting your shovel that deep. Once that person is in the ground, my journey now changes. What does that look like? I leave. I leave with the soul. I take your soul and away we go. Now my journey is really beginning. I go to the other side. I get that sleet and bring it to your ancestors. We go through this veil. I can't barely see things. I can't barely make out anything. But what I do see are these people right here. Beings waiting to thrive on souls, eating them. If I don't bring you across, these people get you. And they will eat your soul, literally eat it. When I come back, ladies and gentlemen, I lose parts of myself there. 47 and a half years of that can have its toll on you. Trust me, it can. I'm up by uh, a place called Split Rock. I've been coming up here for, well, since I was a boy. This is like our backyard. Not only are these beings been, um, have taken some hits over the years, but uh, it's not just for that why I come here. I, I come here for, for peace, quiet. It helps me let go of a lot of frustration or anger. And, and then I can think and focus, not just what I'm doing, but also what's going on in my life. It's been months and still no word on the planned reinterment of the objects from Yeyemnet. So I head to the Royal BC Museum to see for myself what becomes a First Nations artifacts there. I'm the collection manager here. And what the collection manager does is looks after um, all the objects in the collection, um, first of all, to keep them safe. And second of all, uh, most importantly, is to make them accessible. Fish hooks for catching deep sea rock cod fish. Yeah. Look at that. These would be used for rock cod or bottom feeding fish. And their mouth would come over like that. And then that barb would hook them. And this would be attached to the top and pull it straight up. Amazing. Beautiful. Okay, let's look at another one. Ah! Wow. Look at this one. So they push these down with long, long cedar. And they push, put it right there like that, and then push it all the way down. And then pull it back, quick take the pole out and then this thing would flip over because this is light. It's almost like cork and this would spin. It would spin like this underwater and the fish would come up to try and grab it and then the guys would spear them. That's how they got them, to make the, uh, the cod come up so they could hit it from the canoes. Indian spoon made from horn of a cow used by Indians of South Vancouver Island, obtained in Saanichton Reserve, 1919. A spoon. When we're doing a lot of our burning, this is what the ancestral people want to see, are these. 
they ask for it. Where are the old spoons? Where's the old, where's the old schreisels? Mm. Cups, where are they? Mm. How come you're giving me, what is this? And they grab the glass and they're going like this. Is it something to see? Do we look through this? And the person who's conducting the burn is, is speaking to them in old language saying, no, it's what the water goes in. And they just shake their head and they're mad. They don't know what this glass, they don't know what glass is. So looking at these old items here, and now I get to see and understand what they wanted, what they were asking for. You know, it's never a favor, and it's, uh, it's everyone's right mm. to come in and to see these objects. You know, it'd be, it would be really nice one day to see these go back into, a, into the hands of our, our people. Any group, any First Nations government that's in um, treaty negotiations with the government these collections are part of that, so they will at some point be negotiating how, well, how much of these collections might stay mm. and how much of them uh, will, would be going back. I think this needs to be shared about the p political battles we face as uh, Aboriginal people when it comes to repatriation and when it comes from a museum. Now we gotta, we got to go through so many hoops, and I understand that. I'm, I'm not ignorant to it. It's just frustrating. I'm hoping down the road to make some headway, and so we're not, as Aboriginal people, waiting years for our ancestors to come back to us and to get them back into the ground. One day's too late, one body's too much. We're working um, with a developer who had had traditional land of the Malahat First Nation. And there was this huge cedar tree, huge. And we're standing with the land developer, owner, whatever. And he's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna push this over. And I looked at it and I said, she's beautiful. Leave her alone. Just cut her hair, trim her. It's good enough. And then he goes, nope, need room for the condos. I said, condos, condos. Just cut her hair, man. She's got to be close to 400 years old. It's beautiful. No. Nope. We left. The next day we went back. He was pushing it. And I said to the archaeologist, I said, he pushes that over. We're going to have Pandora's box and everything. Hell's coming to breakfast and really fast. And it did. He pushed it over. Well, we got to go over there. And everything was in there. Everything was under that tree. Tools, hammers, everything, people. And then he gives the old, ah, oh, oh yeah. And now, our, I think we had a permit for like a week. It went five months. <laughs> we got them people out, all out, got them wrapped put them away. Now this is the sad part. They sat in a steel container for almost two years, waiting for reburial. And you know what it came down to? If you don't get ancestral people in the ground right away, like quick, whump, fast, things are gonna happen. There is some bone fragments I'm finding. We're on the beach at Poets Cove, Pender Island. There was a major village site here um, back in the early 1800s, mid 1800s, and possibly even further back. What it is now is a resort. There was just mounds of dirt and I was looking at this like, what the hell? And then they had these sifter belts, just crushed bones and artifacts and tools going by you. And I'm, I'm looking at this like, this is, this is crazy. I was watching these elders crying. And Simon Fraser University agreed with uh, Saanich and First Nation, which is Sawit, to, to do a, a repatriation, do some major work here. And it did take place. It took place this year, just months, months ago. 
there was a couple of girls that worked here and, and they did some, they were waitressing. And they said they'd see images going down the hall or, or hearing things in the, in the kitchen stock or something, you know, a chair moving. I'm glad they're still here and they're very active and they're, you know, throwing the haunt on the, the people who come here to get, a, to get away. Well, you can get away, all right, but you're not gonna escape our people. For us as First Nations, we understand that we don't leave the area of mm -hmm. burial or, or burial sites, cemeteries, and that sort. Um, elders have taught me that. From my own tradition as a, as a Celt, mm. we say that the distance between this reality and another reality which we call heaven is only paper thin. Burial ground, cemeteries, what we call them, are what we call thin places. Mm. Thin places where that reality is present between those who have gone, uh, who, who have died, and this, the, those who have stayed on. Sometimes that veil is pulled back and there's a connection between this reality and the other reality. I was on the river and, and there was a lot of salmon moving. It was just before dark and I swear to you, I thought I heard a wooden canoe going like beaching. And I thought, oh, some bros down below coming up with a canoe night. Cool, I'll have some people. Well, I waited and waited and now it got dark so I couldn't see. So I walked down to where I thought I heard the canoe and I looked down there and there was nothing. And I went, wow, I wonder what that was. And right away I went, that, that was old people. This elder told me, he said, you know, they're, they're in that time and in that place when they pass, they still think they're fishing. So they'll always come to the river, always come to the river. And what you heard was not just in your mind, it was, it was real. Now I know when I'm on the river, so are the ancestors. There's so many teachings against Nawayath that comes from the old people. You know, you gotta look after your spear and look after everything else, look after the salmon too as well. You know, when I, I catch my first one, I, I, I thank it. I make an offering to it because it is giving its life to you and it's, it's feeding you and your people. Hello, Diane? Yeah, it's Harold. Yeah. Hey, I was just calling to see if you uh, heard anything from um, RBCM on the uh, re-internment for Yayam Nuts, the artifacts. Wow. Wonder what the holdup is. Oh, okay. Well, maybe send another email and see if we get anything back and, uh, all right, bye-bye. Damn politics. So what got you into getting into politics? Uh, well, I grew up on the res, man. The, the reality about the, the Indian Reserve in Canada is it's intensely political, it's, it's uh, by, by its design. Uh, and so it's, it was a natural thing for me to, um, to, to be political. Getting into politics is something different. If you were growing up on a reserve, have you ever seen uh, desecrations or digging up of our ancestral people? No. The first time that I ran into it really was uh, just in, in, I think it was 2014, with Grace Islet, um, which is in uh, just off Salt Spring Island. On Salt Spring Island, the day was met with protest as hundreds vowed to protect an ancient First Nations burial site on Grace Islet in Ganges Harbour. This after an application to build a house on the islet was approved by the provincial government. It's a small development that sparked huge controversy. Since construction began, the community has rallied with First Nations, calling on the government to step in and put a stop to the project. First Nations say Grace Islet is a traditional burial ground and construction of the home should never have been permitted. It was eye-opening for me. It was eye-opening for me as to how the modern world uh, respects, or in this case not respects, uh, Indigenous uh, grave sites and sacred sites. I think that it's been impacting much more than just the Indigenous communities in this province. I am the head of the First Nations and Repatriation Department, and it's a whole new um, department. 
The position is really trying to take the museum in a new direction of repatriation, reconciliation, um, and celebrating and honoring the first peoples whose treasures we, we house here. I think every museum could be doing things to be a little bit more respectful and to be more proactive. How do you manage to walk this line, if you will, to maintain your, your real self and to, and to work in a place like this and know that we're kept here? So how do you balance that out? I knew that would be, that would be hard. Mm. Um, to be one of the only Aboriginal voices in this institution and to be one of the only Aboriginal voices in museums in North America. I'm still learning how to balance, I think. A lot of the remains that ended up in, in museums um, were from people coming in and looting um, caves or taking them out of the um, mortuary poles, you know, the, we used to put, put people up into um, poles. And it feels like that's been a really long time of disruption and hurt. The two biggest scientific expeditions that came to Victoria, the first two were in 1898, but they were preceded by, um, by the earliest incarnation of Natural History Society here in Victoria. And they came and excavated burial cairns here uh, in this part of Victoria uh, in huge numbers. We really have no idea how many. They had pry bars and they, they were you know, prying these apart. And so they rolled the big rocks out of the way and then the human remains were collected. Some of these remains have been repatriated and some of them are still in warehouses or repositories around the world. Just hearing what you're saying, and I can feel inside myself getting angry and it hurts. Yeah. Desecration of our resting places has been going on for far too long. Cemeteries, from, from my perspective, are also places of keeper of memories. There are places where we go to continue a relationship. The tradition uh, that we brought when we came from the other parts of the world was to, to mark those places uh, with stones, uh, with monuments. But that doesn't make it holy. That doesn't make it an important place. What makes it important place is those who have gone before us, those who have been buried there, uh, and to honor that, uh, that another generation uh, is, has been there and um, that we continue to, to recognize those places as holy because our ancestors are there, those who have gone before us are in that place. Colonial power uh, takes away the memory of a people mm. and desecrates the traditional burial grounds. And that's a kind of control over the, the people when they come in. And we're here in Ross Bay. Mm -hmm. Cemetery. Cemetery. Mm -hmm as settlers, as people living here in Victoria, we're very comfortable calling this a cemetery. We understand the rules and the structure around how this place is built. But you go to Coast Salish Cemetery, and we call it a burial ground or whatever. I was trained to call that an archeological site, but maybe it's not an archeological site at all. And maybe human remains aren't artifacts at all, that they are, that this is a, a sacred space. You know, I get that question asked. Harold, how do, how do I tell when I'm on a, on a, on a burial ground, as right. you say, your people are here? You know, there's no identification markers, there's no names. How do you know and how do I know? Yeah. You, know how, you know, if I'm gonna go and develop something there, I mean, I didn't know. Yeah. I said, well, you ask. Exactly. Or you if ask. you see something, go, go to the neighboring nation and say, hey, by the way, is this your traditional territory? Because we're thinking of developing or, you know, parking lot, house, condo. And then when you start hitting those burial grounds, and then they go, oh my God, you know, we didn't know there was people there. And then we're brought in, I'm brought in, you're brought in, and it's way too late. It's already been desecrated. We as Aboriginal people are still, you know, we're fighting, but we have to be the voice for the ancestral people. And I believe that's what I am, and I believe that's what you are, and many others. And I think if we, uh, safety in numbers, safety numbers, we can make a change. The Grace Islet situation that unfolded over a few years, mm. and that was a really painful process for many, many people. And uh, I know you and I were entangled in that in various ways. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that came out of that that really gave me a sense of hope 
were all the people on Salt Spring Island, non-archaeologists, mm -hmm. non-Indigenous people, yeah. local people, who really put a lot on the line. And many people came together and, uh, and said, look, this is not acceptable. The way that th this is unfolding is not what we want. It's not a progressive way. It's not a respectful way of doing this. And there were hundreds of people that came and protested. been almost four years now, I guess, since I've been back to Grace. Grace is the resting place of our ancestral people. All around this little islet, there's burials. And for me to see what I saw when I first arrived here, I was quite blown away by it. And the very basement of the house was in a cased Karen he had encased it with two by fours and such. I just looked at it and I said, you gotta be kidding me. When the demolition team started to dismantle this mansion, I was here for that first week and a half on the island with the team. And they gave me the actual honor to uh, hit out the first board. And I believe it was about right in here. And basically the guy goes, here you go, chief, whale away. I hit that thing hard and it flew. And as soon as we did that, the crew just went into their own positions and just started ripping. But yeah, to be back here almost four years later to see this in its natural state is, it's beautiful. And this is a victory, a small little victory for our people it's places like this and it's people like all the Salt Spring Island people. It's them, you know, that were here in the front lines when all this was taking place. And then we came in behind them. Oh, I got to take this. Hello? Yep. Oh, really? Nice. That's great. That's excellent news. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that's amazing. Yes. Okay. Thank you. We'll talk soon. All right. Bye-bye. Oh, great. We just got a call from uh, my boss on... Uh, Reinternment going back in um, Yayum Nuts, back in Couch. About time. When you put someone in the ground and the artifacts don't go back with them, it's like they're missing a big part of themselves. When you hold something in some place, in some locked cabinet or in some basement, the dead don't rest. So when the tools and the artifacts and all their sacred objects go back with them, it's a closure for our ancestors. Repatriation and reconciliation, do they go hand in hand? Um, I think very much so. The largest uh, Anglican residential school in Canada was in our territories, in our island, in Alert Bay. 9,000 children. And what I'm faced with all the time was folk saying, that wasn't me. Mm. That wasn't me who did that. Mm -hmm. um, but it was us. It might not have been me personally involved in that. Mm -hmm. It might be another generation. But at the end of the day, it was us. And um, I've been honoured in positions to give apologies for that mm -hmm. and to say that when we came to these territories, we failed to see the creator in your language, your culture, your teaching. Um, and we failed you. And we failed ourselves. And we failed the creator. 
uh, on that journey. Um, so it's really important that as part of that reconciliation, we say it was us. So when we have desecrated um, burial grounds, when we have taken away artifacts, uh, whether those are bones or, or, or masks or um, traditional regalia, uh, that needs to be taken back where it belongs to and given back um, in part of that truth-telling. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful, gentlemen. We're just getting started. How'd you get Sam? How'd you get to Nen? Holmuch Mustimuch to Nen. We're out here on Yeyemnats. The ancestors are in the ground, and today we are putting back with them the tools that came from here. It's for them I'm happy for it more than anything, because I know when there's something that's missing from them, they don't rest. It's an honor that I've been asked to rebury the tools for them and put it back in the ground, and everything's gonna be okay. looking for a place to erect a lodge. Sir Matthew Bailey Bigby, Chief Justice of British Columbia, the hanging judge. Well, I thought of putting it here, but it'll be too close to the road. Isn't gonna work. Emily Carr, beautiful soul, beautiful lady. Excellent painter. Not going to do the lodger. Well, well, well. James Douglas. The treaty maker. I think this is where I'm going to build my lodge. Right here. Okay, bring in the backhoe. Back it up. That's it. 